In the last two videos, we looked at phonetics and how we can use different parts of our mouth to then produce the sounds of human language. We have different articulators like lips, tongue, vocal cords, which then produce the sounds of our languages. But we didn't talk about what goes on in your brain. How do you get an audio signal and then transform it onto a mental representation? Or the other way around, how do you turn a mental representation into motions of your mouth? This is the field of study of phonology. Phonology studies the mental representation of sounds and how sounds are put together and their interactions finally determine the motions of your mouth. So we're going to be talking about abstractions of sounds and what better abstraction than the symbol of Superman. So Superman is a concept, like an abstract concept. And then there's context specific manifestations of Superman. In some contexts, he is Clark Kent, for example, when he's working at the newspaper. In some other contexts, like when he has to save the city, he is Superman. So both of these are contextual manifestations of the same underlying reality of Superman. Likewise, in our brains, uh, likewise, in, in our languages, we have different phonetic manifestations for what we conceive as the same sound. Uh, for example, in English, the word uh, B-U-T-T-E-R, for what you spread on bread, has a T in the middle, but it, it is not pronounced butter. It is pronounced butter, at least in um, American English, butter. So the T in butter sounds different from the T in telephone, for example. Even though in your mind, both of these are a kind of a different kinds of T, but they're both T. The mental reality we're going to call a phoneme, which is your mental representation that these two different sounding things are somehow the same. And each of their actual phonetic manifestations is going to be called an allophone. The T in telephone and the R in butter. So these are allophones and their unifying mental representation is a phoneme. Let's take a look. This um, phonology studies the processes that turn phonemes into actual sounds of the language. The phonemes are the abstraction and the allophones are the actual output from your mouth. Every language has many, many phonological rules. I'm going to give you two examples from English. For example, English has something called a dark L. It has two sounds for L. One of them is L, which is, for example, in lift or leaf, la, la, leaf. That this one is the non-dark one. And then there's the dark one, which is the one that happens at the end of a syllable. Pool, pool, or pull, or bell, for example, or tall. If your L is at the end of a syllable, it is not pronounced tall, bell. Um, it is pronounced tall with a different action of your tongue. So if it's at the beginning of a word, it is la, and at the end, it's la, la, la. Both of these are the allophones, which correspond to a reality that we have in your brain that these two are the same sound. They're both kinds of L. It's just they sound different in different contexts. Here's a second example. And by the way, I'm including the phonological rule in, phonologi in, in the format that you studied in Linguistics 1, just in case you took that class. But if you haven't, just ignore what's at the bottom of the screen. Another uh, phonological rule for English is the one that changes a T and a D onto a flap, a ra. For example, butter. In the word butter, there is a T in the middle. But it, is, it sounds different from the T in telephone. T, telephone, T, butter, ra, butter. This change also happens in words like 
ladder, which is not said ladder, it's ladder. It happens in words like murder, which is not merger, murder. It does not happen in words like Tom, which is said Tom and not Rom. Tom, Rom. So these two manifestations of a T, T and R, are allophones of the T, of the single phoneme T in English. And when, what is the context for these allophones? It's a little bit more complex. You get a flap whenever you have a sound that is, uh, that is preceded, that comes after a vowel, an N, or an R. So in butter and murder, there's a vowel before the T, not in Tom. Tom does not have a vowel before it, so this rule cannot engage. But there's also a second element to the rule. The T needs to be followed by an unstressed vowel. Um, so if these two things occur, like in the words butter and murder, you can transform the T and the D onto a flap. And most speakers of North American English do transform it. So as you can see, um, phonemes are an abstract reality in your brain. The idea that there's a T there and the actual sounds are different. Sometimes there's a T, sometimes it's something that sounds a little bit more like an R and so on. All of these rules are context sensitive. They need to read the context before they can apply. In the case of the dark L, as you can see, the L becomes dark or velarized if it's at the end of a syllable or next to a syllable edge. Or the way we said it in week two, the symbol A, which is the L, next to the C, which is the edge of the syllable, becomes a different symbol B, velarized L, next to the edge of the syllable. So these are rules where you need the, con uh, the specific type of context before the rule can engage. Uh, tap, uh, flapping or tapping in English is that a T can become uh, ra if it's in between a vowel, an N, and an R, and an unstressed vowel. So as you can see, A, the vowel, uh, B, the T, and C, the unstressed vowel, become A, something else, a D, and a C. So why do we care about phonemes? Because phonemes are the what morphemes are made of. Morphemes contain phonemes. And so morphemes can have different uh, phonetic and context specific manifestations. For example, the ED morpheme in English is the past tense, as in walked or, um, I don't know, jogged. <laughs> but e, the morpheme is not always a D. Sometimes it can come out as a T with the right environment. The environment in English is being surrounded by a voiceless consonant, by a consonant without the vocal cords being active, where the vocal cords are not vibrating. So the K is voiceless, and it triggers a devoicing of the past tense. So what you actually get in the spectrogram is a T, worked. If the final consonant of the root is voiced, like g, like a g, then you get the voiced d, dragged, worked, dragged. So the um, the sound wave that you'll get, the spectrogram, is going to have all sorts of changes that are because of context, because of how the phonemes are interacting with one another. So your computer system is going to have to create a mapping where sometimes it sees a T and it maps it onto a T and sometimes it has to map it onto a D because, oh, this is the D of the past tense, for example. Or sometimes it will see, it will see two types of L's and it has to map both of them to just one L for English. In summary, phonology studies the relationships between the mental representations of sounds, like the word has an L, the word has a T, so those are mental representations. It studies the relationship between that and the actual phonetic manifestations. What are the actual motions of your mouth? 
Sometimes a D can come out as a T, as in worked. Sometimes an L can, can come out as a dark L, like in pool. What your mind is storing is phonemes, and what your mind is producing is phones or allophones. And when you hear a language, what you're getting are the phones. And then your mind has to transform those allophones into the phonemes that make up the morphemes. So your, your mind is doing some sort of mapping from these sound units onto mental units. And our speech recognition systems are going to have to do something similar, where they can map more than one sound onto a single uh, classification entity. So it can say that, oh, both la and la are just types of L, for example.